We up here, Miranda and Lisa with Faith Fitness, and so we're so glad to have live class and online class, and um, I'm going to open up in prayer, and then we will get, get going here. So um, just as I pray, just sit up on the back of your bike. We really like to take a minute to roll your shoulders so you can just sit up straight. Don't, don't, you don't have to have heavy or any resistance right now. Let's just get warmed up and take some deep breaths. In through your nose, out through your mouth, give some oxygen to our body as we're going to move it. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come and we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you that we get to move our bodies, Lord, in this way. And we thank you for your word that washes over us and renews us, Lord. We thank you the life found in your words, Lord. And so um, we just bless your holy name and um, we just invite you, Jesus, to come and minister to us. I pray that you would encourage every heart, Lord, and that you, by the power of your word, would speak to every person and every ear, um, that they should be encouraged, Lord, and strengthened in you, um, and that they could be going out from this place with their mind set on the kingdom of God and your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So we just come and bring you our worship right now and we just praise you for coming to join us and coming to minister to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So with spin, you wanna make sure you're always, you can sit upright, or you can push forward from the hips. No rounded back, no rounded diaphragm, and your elbows are always loose. Just warming up to this song. You know it, Lord, completely. You hid me in behind and before, 
you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. And if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness as of light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only, God, you would slay the wicked away from me, all you are who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those that hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. And then he says this. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and see if there's any anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139. Stand for the song. You can take song by song. What do you need? Using this affliction 
to draw you closer to his heart. He was given a promise. You will be king. And he hid in caves and ran for his life for years. He kept honoring the Lord during this time. He could have killed Saul a couple times over. And he said, I won't do it. I won't kill God's anointed one. You see, he had a call. But it was through that suffering that he learned perseverance. God used it all for David's good, for the prophecy of Jesus to come through the line of David. It was more than just David's life that was at stake here. This was the promise of God to be fulfilled for the Messiah to come through this line. You don't think hell was after that? Uh, yeah. You see it over and over. So it's easy to want to quit in suffering. The Lord has shown me many times in my life when I pray for things year after year after year. And the Lord has shown me his answer sometimes can look like a trial. But it is bringing about a good purpose in my life, in my husband's life, in my children's life. And if we only view suffering as just only evil, get away from it, run, 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 we could miss the clinging to the Lord, the growing in our heart that can trust in God alone. Lisa read this verse this morning when we oaked, when we prayed, and I just want to read it now again. You can go back to a cover still if you want for this song. First Peter 4, 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. And as a result, they do not live the rest of their lives for earthly lies or human desire, evil desire, but rather for the will of God. And he caught my eye here, going down to verse 7, he said, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Think about Peter. The Lord said, I'm going to build my church on you. Yet, what did he do? He's the only one, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Your mind is set on earthly things and not the things of God. Peter thought he was being compassionate. Oh, no, Lord, you don't have to die. There's another way. There's another way. Hebrews tells us, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Peter denied Christ three times. It wasn't until he was filled fully with the Spirit and until he was sifted, until he suffered, until he realized, as Jesus told him in the garden, when the, when the, the, what are they called? Um, I want to say like cops, but the, the guards, the Roman guards, when they came to arrest Jesus and, and he chops off an ear and Jesus heals the ear and says, no, those who live by the sword die by the sword. He's like, I'm giving you a different sword. I'm giving you a sword of the spirit. And we don't fight like the world fights. No, no, no. It's going to be done in prayer. It's going to be done in submission. 
the world will tell you, get it together, fake it till you make it. The Lord says, come and die so you can live. Lose everything so you can have everything. You see, it's so easy in my own life. It's so easy to think about things from what I see. Even now in some of the trials I have, I am tempted. I am tempted to view it from what I see. I am tempted to be shaken and quaked. What do I do about this? What do I do about this? Oh no, there's this hair, this hair. And quieting my heart before the Lord. What do you say about the matter? Even that verse that Peter said, and he said, they're done away with sin, right? No, we're not. He doesn't mean that you're perfect and you're never going to struggle. But I can testify, even though I have to regularly repent, and even though there are sins that the Lord has maybe not opened my eyes to, and I will be continue to be refined and sanctified. I will I'll never be perfect until I'm in the presence of the living Savior. But I can attest that He has caused my heart to want His things. That He has caused my heart to not want to live for my own earthly desires. Do I still do it sometimes? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I get to repent and say, search my heart, O God, and know me. And see if there is any of his way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Just as, as David said. So can we, can we even think right now. What are you going through? Or what's a hard thing in your life? What's something that you just wish could be over? And Lord, could you give us eyes. To see that perhaps it was a prayer that we forgot that we prayed. Because believe me, the Lord has to remind me sometimes. My husband teases me. I was telling him in Revelation that it says there's a bowl in it and it's filled with the prayers of the saints. And then at the end of the age, the angel dips in the censer. And then that's what God uses to enact judgment on the earth. And my husband jokes and says, they had to have a bowl for you just by yourself. I don't even remember the Lord. I just have always prayed about things that God has reminded me lately. This looks like suffering, Miranda. This is an answer to your prayer. This is an answer. Do you see they're coming to me? Do you see they're growing in me? Do you see the refinement in my hand? Do you see the healing? Do not resist. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're so gracious. Abraham 
to offer the one thing that he had asked for. He had asked for a son. And God has given the promise way back that it will be your own flesh and blood that will become your heir. And Abraham was a hundred years old. He's like, how is this going to happen? So all weekend, he's bringing me through Genesis 22. When he was seeing they illustrate it. I don't know which is start works. God says, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. On a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. You can do weights on this one if you want to. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of a son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The Lord has been walking me through a few things, hard things, and I asked him if he's been disciplining me in an area. You see, I believe God to provide for some things, but I really like to help him out in other areas. I like to offer a pay, I'm going to help you out a little, I'm going to sacrifice here, I'm going to give this sacrifice, and he's saying, the Lord will provide the birth offering for himself. So he's taking me through the season of, do you truly believe that in your heart, that I will provide? Last night as I was going to bed, I'm like, where are you saying that from? And it's again, Genesis 22. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So I just want to encourage you, if you're in the middle of chewing on something, too, with the Lord, that that's a gift. He's transforming you into the image of Christ. He's working on your heart to trust Him. What songs are so... <laughs> I'm going to go back and read that one part that Lisa read. Lord, bring it to my heart. Genesis 22, 12. End of 11. 
Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. I remember asking the Lord about that. Lord, you know all things. Anyone ever done a study on the attributes of God? God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. Actually, Psalm 139. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, oh Lord. Yes. Nothing's hidden from you. We get a lot of those attributes from Psalm 139. Omniscient. All-knowing. So one could say, but why did you have to do that? Because that word, if you look at the Hebrew, it is as a man known a wife. It is an intimacy of knowing by experience. See, because we see from the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve came to the end of Revelation, where we will all live, and we won't be done because God is our life, that He wants relationship. It is not a religion. We make it religion. We make it rules. We make it all these things. It is relationship. It is come and have a relationship with me. Abide in me, but by yourself you can do nothing. And I love that the scriptures are filled with flawed people. I already mentioned Peter. If the Lord could build his church on someone whom he said, Get behind me, Satan. There's nothing our God can't do. And no one is too far to be rescued in relationship. Think about it. Like, if you ask your husband or your wife or, or a friend or you want to seek counsel, what do you think I should do about this? <laughs> Jeremiah 17 says, Curse is anyone who trusts in man alone. Like, why wouldn't we do that to our Savior? God, what do you say about this? Well, what do you say, Lord? Many times I'm like Peter. I'm out there walking on water. My eyes are on Jesus. Miracles are happening. But the wind blows. And I'm drowning in the two seconds. And Lord, oh, I'm over here. You know, I, I, I struggle. But it's in the relationship that he's calling. And the Lord goes on to say in that Genesis 22, Now I know that you offered me your only son. See, guys, think about it. Okay, you want me to kill? It took me 25, 30 years, and I had a failed concubine issue, and a whole nation came from that. We've been waiting and waiting. I wait for the promise, and you want me to kill it? That doesn't make sense. Surely I heard you wrong. Surely I could disobey that body. But Romans 4 says that Abraham believed God. He believed that God could raise dead things. And by it, it was his credit to him as righteousness. And not just for him, but you also who believe. And even goes on to say that if it was only the law, then you would be heirs of the promise. The enemy would love to, to trap us in shame, condemnation, distraction, petty fights, looking at things as if they were human issues and not spiritual ones. What if the very thing you're clinging to, the very thing you're trying to save, the Lord is like, let it go in my hands. So bring them to me. Look, as if it looks like it is going to die. I have been there with my children, with my husband. God has called me to lay in with my own life. But then He provides. It's like He calls me to that point of like, even if, Lord, even if, even if you take them, even if, even if. Okay, I surrender. Now I know. Now I know. Nobody experienced. She's 
gonna let me work. She's gonna let me move. He's gonna let me perform mighty miracles and raise dead things. So you guys can stand and have some fun with this one. After it says, I'm out for the Lord, it will be divided. And I need no question to read that last part. And now I do. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I swear by myself, he doesn't tell us about our faithfulness, he tells us about his.
No, see, the Lord was faithful yes. to his covenant. So he tells Abraham, he says, go and get the, get the uh, a heifer and a goat and a ram, three years old, along with the dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him. He cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite of each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. The birds of prey came down and the carcass to the carcasses. But Abraham drove them away. He's waiting on the Lord. He, he, he cut him up and he's waiting. And as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep. And a thick and a dreadful darkness came over him. And then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go on to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. It goes on to say, and on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And he said, to your descendants, I give this land. And he lifts off all the, the jurisdictions, the places. But I want to say something that we don't maybe know in our modern culture. But... That covenant was something that people would make with each other. And the weaker one, it symbolized this. Those animals cut in half is like, so be it to me that I would end up like these animals if I break this covenant. Right? But the Lord himself is the one who walked through. And so the Lord himself is saying, so be it to me if I fail in my word and my faithfulness to you. And I believe that our hearts need to hear this again. Because we'd like to think, we're just tempted. God failed. God failed. But as Lisa read, he works all things together for good for those who love him. Quit judging. Who told you to look at your harvest yet? It may not be the right time. Because the one thing I've learned about the Lord in all my years of trial and suffering is that my God is faithful. And I can share weaknesses and I have no problem telling you guys that I that I fail. None whatsoever. Because far be it for me if you would think that I would be the one that could say, oh, I'm just so good. Yep, I'm just so good. No. My God is good. My God is faithful. A righteous man is double. He trips seven times but the Lord is able to lift him back up. And I feel a burning to call out hope in your life and grip tight to the words of God. He is faithful. Not one word of the Lord will fail. He says, so be it to me. Let it be done to me if I don't fulfill. Even Roman says there's a partial hardening over the Jews right now so that the full salvation can come to the Gentiles. But you want God to be faithful to the Jews because that, that, that blesses us. Like, we need to see He's a covenant-keeping God. And he said all nations will be blessed. Salvation will come through you, through the Jewish line, through those people. And I've had that correction in my heart. I've had the Lord where I just wanted to look at the crop and be like, Lord, I obeyed you here. It wasn't perfect, but I obeyed you. Why does it look bad? And the Lord says, it's not time. It's not time to check that yet. So as he's saying that to you, hang on to those promises. We can slow down on this last song.
for, but our prayer be like David at the end of Psalm 139. Search my heart, oh God. Like he's angry about these things, right? He's angry. He gets that little interlude. Oh Lord, search my heart and know me. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, by your kindness, could you show our, our lives, our eyes, could you unveil areas of unbelief so that we can surrender and actually have greater joy. Joy that can be taken by circumstances. Anchored in you, Lord Jesus.